Hi, I'm going to read a short story from Bob Stromberg's book, Why Geese Fly Farther Than Eagles. So let's get right into it. This story is titled Deception, Integrity, and Blackmail. In 1962, when I was a 10-year-old towhead, I attended Miss Sayers' fifth grade class in my little town of Canoe Place. I liked Mrs. Sayers a whole lot, and I thought she liked me too. On the second day of school, Lorna Culver and I were chosen to work on the bulletin board out in the hallway. It was a privilege to do so, and only Laura and I, two out of 31 students, were chosen. It's true that when I had volunteered, I sat as still as possible, staring ahead with a stone expression, my arms straight up and motionless. But that's not why Mrs. Sayers chose me. I knew it was because she liked me. Lorna and I were given free reign over the art closet. Toward the end of each year, the art closet, and art class for that matter, became a little discouraging. Miss Owens, our part-time roving art instructor, was an innovative teacher, but it had to be difficult at the end of the year to come up with two months of creative ideas of things you could make with empty glue bottles and tacks. But today, the 8th of September, the closet was full of colored construction paper, crayons, and even a bottle of glitter, the first I had ever seen. Lorna and I decided to make a large welcome back sign surrounded by falling leaves, footballs, and in keeping with the autumn theme, a small triceratops in the upper corner. The dinosaur was my idea, of course. <laughs> what does a dinosaur have to do with fall? <laughs> back to school time. I don't know. <laughs> That's the little boys for you. Lorna was up on the table fastening the last fall leaf when I discovered a tack that had no point. It was just the head, which, lying flat in my palm, created an illusion of severe pain. Oh, Lorna, I feigned. <laughs> Look at my hand. Oh, no, I can't stand it. Oh, the pain. <laughs> it's, remarkably, it's remarkable what gravity can do to an unconscious body. Lorna hit the floor like a lump of warm clay, just as Mrs. Sayers came through the door. Well, children, how are my artists, she said with a smile, not yet noticing that one of us was dead. Oh, my goodness, Lorna, dear. Mrs. Sayers knelt down and rolled Lorna's limp body over. Bobby, what happened? I, I, I don't know, I trembled, tears filling my eyes. I just lo showed Lorna my, and I opened my hands for Mrs. Sayers to see. I watched about three-quarter speed as her face turned the color of a dirty chalkboard, and her, she rolled her eyeballs back into her head, sharing a part of herself with me I'd never known. Lorna was just coming, too, when Mrs. Sayers sort of slumped back on top of her. This was a brand-new experience for Lorna, too, who now lay in the corner beneath her sleeping teacher. If this... <laughs> so both Lorna and Mrs. Sayers passed out, huh? Just because Bobby held up the head of a tack in his hand. If this had happened the year before in the fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Fund, Fudd, would have reprimanded me sternly and carried me by the skin to the back of the, my neck to the principal's office. My principal, Mr. Pellegrini, would have looked over my shoulder as I copied the letter of my parents to my letter to my parents expressing my sincerest desire to transfer to the nearby military academy. But for some reason... Mrs. Sayers liked me. Oh, you character, she said with a faint laugh, as Shelley Sullivan, who wanted to be a nurse when she grew up, daubed Mrs. Sayers' forehead with a wet paper towel. What more proof did I need that she liked me? A few days later, at an all-boys assembly program, Mr. Pellegrini told us fifth graders he was looking for a few good men. He encouraged us to be all that we could be and find our future as patrol boys. He asked, he said, ask not what your school can do for you. Ask what you can do for your school. I didn't know why he said that line with a funny accent, but it didn't matter. I was stirred by his speech and felt I had something to strive for. The patrol boys were an elite group of the very best Arnold Avenue school had to offer. Only 12 boys were chosen from the fifth and sixth grades to be highly trained in pedestrian safety. They carried long, menacing poles with red flags tied to the end, and they wore pure silver state-issued badges. 
on white patrol sashes across their chests and were given the authority to stop irresponsible students at the crosswalk and report vagrants directly to Mr. Pellingrini. They were Mr. P's hand-picked squad and nobody messed with the patrol boys. It was rumored, though I never believed it, that on being commissioned, each boy was told Mr. Pellingrini's first name. I didn't believe any child knew Mr. P's first name. During the 12 years he had been principal, perhaps as many as 150 boys had gone through the patrol ranks. If that many knew his first name, surely some deviant junior hire would have leaked it out by now. But no one had. At least twice a month, we were given blue mimeograph sheets to take home to our parents. As a distribution ritual, all of us would take the sheets passed over the head to the student in front of us, shove the whole pile to our nose for a whiff, remove the top one for ourselves, and two-hand it over our heads to the student behind. We'd been doing this for years and did it well. Then we would scan the copy, informing our parents of important meeting of the PTA. At the bottom, we would read the signature, L. Pellingrini, Principal. I remember I wanted to be a patrol boy, but I didn't get picked. I guess I just didn't have the right stuff. Often when the hall was filled with children and Mr. P was at his post, one of the older boys would look slightly past him and shout down the hall, Hey, Larry! Or, Hey, Leonard! The boy helped hope that Mr. Pellingrini would look his way and therefore reveal the truth, but he never did. The patrol boy selection process would take two weeks. Mr. Pellingrini would watch us all carefully, consult with our teachers about our academic progress and in-class behavior, and he would make his selection. These would, these would be posted on the bulletin board outside the main office. I had never wanted anything so bad in my life to think I might be given the privilege of getting up in the dark on winter mornings and walking to school through the blizzard that would turn back lesser boys, that I would enter the school early, and Mr. Lewis, the custodian, with Mr. Lewis, the custodian, and together with the chosen few, select our pole from the closet marked Mr. P's Patrol, that I would walk proudly eight or nine more blocks to my corner, where I would serve my principal, my school, and my country. And that wasn't all. After two years of flawless service, I would board a yellow school bus before dawn, ride seven hours to Washington, D.C., where together with my squad, I would be giving a f given a four-hour tour of the White House, the Capitol, and the Post Department, the Treasury, Arlington Cemetery, the Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln Memorials, and eat a free bag lunch before returning home. That was back in the days when we did things cheaper here in America, I'm telling you. My hope was exhilarating but my fear weakened my knees as I stood with at least 50 others watching Mr. Pellingrini post the tiny list. It read, Captain Mark Rackish, Arnold Avenue, East Corner. Number two, Craig Mundy, Arnold Avenue, West Corner. Number three, Barry Bergenson, Maple Street. Number four, Mark Elliott, Broad Street. Number five, David Canelli, Chestnut. Number six, Dale Caskey, Keating Avenue. Number seven, Bobby Stromberg, alternate. A small group cheered. Most just walked away. I stood there in disbelief, my eyes filled with tears, sobs threatening to burst through my chest. I felt a hand on my shoulder. So, Bobby, are you proud you made the squad? It was Mrs. Sayers, who obviously didn't understand. Being an alternate wasn't exactly making the squad. The alternate was only called on if a regular got sick. Everyone knew that due to greater responsibilities and resultant height, heightened resistance to viral strains, patrol boys were hardly ever sick. Only once in my memory had an alternate been promised to full -time, promoted to full-time service, and that was when one of the regulars moved away. But the family names on this list had lived in Canoe Place almost since the beginning and I knew they weren't going anywhere. But that wasn't what bothered me most. At that moment, I didn't care that I wouldn't be able to sacrifice my early morning sleep and after-school playtime 
or even that I would miss out on the best trip of my life. It was that the other boys had deemed worthy, been deemed worthier than I. I just don't get it, I said with a sob. I just don't understand. Mr. Pellegrini said he would watch us closely. What did he see in me that wasn't good enough? Oh, Bobby, she said, kneeling down and wiping my eyes with her doily. I'm sure it's not that you're not good enough. Well, then why? What is it? Why didn't he pick? Why did he pick these? And then the truth hit me so hard, I nearly lost my breath. Anger burned through my brush cut, igniting little fire needles in my scalp. Right before my eyes, I saw on the list what Mr. Pellegrini had hidden so well with his rousing speech to all us boys. He knew all along who would be chosen. I had been deceived. It had nothing to do with our behavior or our work. The squadra, squad had been chosen by their street addresses. Right down the list it went. Rackish and Mundy, Arnold Avenue, I mumbled, Canale, Chestnut, Elliot, Broad, Caskey, Bergeson. They all lived near the corners where they had been assigned. As I looked from beneath my brow, I saw the same truth hit Mrs. Sayers. Her draw dropped, and she became the chalky white color I'd seen only weeks before. Excuse me, she said, forcing a smile as she tried to conceal her shock. You need to run along, and of course I have some things I need to do. Then, almost cheerily, congratulations, see you in the morning. She walked into the office and without knocking, marched directly through the door marked L. Pellegrini. As the glass rattled in the slammed door, I heard the muffled arguing voices of my teacher and the principal. What do you suppose they were arguing about? Mrs. Sayers. Muffle, muffle, muffle. Shock! You told these boys that... Muffle, muffle, muffle. Mr. P. Now, now, I muffle, mutter, mutter. Geographic considerations. Mutter, mutter. This went on for a while as I stood by the bulletin board. I wasn't where I could see into the outer office, but I could hear enough to know I shouldn't be there. Finally, the door flew open open and Mr. Pellegrini's black polished shoes echoing on the hardwood floors came quickly. There was no time to shoot for the front entrance or even run the six steps to my classroom. No, Mrs. Sayers, he snapped, stopped for e emphasis, then coming again. We will not discuss this further. Then he was there, his solid gold belt buckle right in my face. The belt buckle had a fancy swirl formed the letter LP. It all happened so quickly that I looked up prayerfully into Mr. P's astonished face. Mrs. Sayers rounded the corner, completely unaware of my presence. Loudly, she protested, but Leslie! Mr. Pellegrini closed his eyes and sighed with his whole body, the way a criminal might do. He realized he'd been caught, and there was no reason to continue the game. It was all over. Mr. Pellegrini's first name was Leslie. There was no doubt in my mind that I was the only child in the history of Arnold Avenue School to know the truth. Not even the patrol boys under sworn oath and threat of dishonorable flunking could have kept this secret. The man's name was Leslie. <laughs> uh, there was a swim coach at my school named Mr. Leslie. That was his last name. But nobody would dare tease him. He was a big bull of a man. <laughs> I did not understand the concept of blackmail, but I think Mr. Pellegrini and Mrs. Sayers did, trying hard to con conceal her amusement. My favorite teacher said, Mr. Pellegrini, I think it would be much safer if we had more, one more patrol boy posted by the bus entrance. Don't you agree? Still motionless, staring toward the ceiling, he answered, Yes, Mrs. Sayers, I think Bobby could begin tomorrow morning. I became a patrol boy because Mrs. Sayers was willing to become my advocate. Until this event, I'd never realized that adults could be unfair and dishonest even toward children. I might have become angry and then bitter or distrusting. And who knows, that might have changed my whole life. But Mrs. Sayers would not allow it to happen. I liked Mrs. Ayers a whole lot, and I knew she liked me too. 
P.S. Patrol Boy wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Neither was our trip to Washington. What I remembered most is throwing up on the bus. <laughs> P.P.S. I never told his name. P.P.P.S. Until now, that is. That's the end. <laughs> Oh, I like these stories. I think I think Bob Stromberg is uh he's kind of a comedic genius. <laughs> By the way, I I heard him say once or maybe it's in the foreword or afterward of this book, he said that uh some of these stories are true, dead true. Others are just completely made up. And uh he said uh the one that people think is the one that people most think is made up is absolutely dead true, and that's the miracle at Stinky Bay. That's all for now. Bye-bye. Love you.